नमस्कार डू यू फील लाइक लाइफ इज गोइंग इन फास्ट लेन लाइक गोइंग सो फास्ट दैट वी आर नॉट एबल टू कीप अप आई फील सो आई डोंट नो इफ यू डू बट थिंग्स आर हैपनिंग एट ब्रेक नेक्स स्पीड वेदर वी लुक एट यूक्रेन रशिया वॉर और चाइना और इंडिया और वॉट इज हैपनिंग इन साइड यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन दैट्स ऑन माई माइंड एंड आई एम होपिंग दैट डॉक्टर एम आर वेंकटेश हुज आर गेस्ट टूडे विल क्लियर इज वाई इज द यू एस डॉलर सो स्ट्रॉन्ग बिकॉज एवरीथिंग एल्स सीम्स टू कम फ्रॉम दैट सो टू आंसर दिस क्वेश्चन एंड टू क्लैरिफाई अ फ्यू अदर थिंग्स डॉक्टर एम आर वेंकटेश इज ज्वाइनिंग एस डॉक्टर एम आर वी नमस्कार अमन वेलकम टू पी ग्रोज चैनल नमस्कार सर नमस्कार so why is the us dollar so strong and they are printing notes like there is no tomorrow don't get me wrong uh, uh, dr mrv i'm happy with the fact that the dollar is so strong but i would like to know for the common man why is the us dollar go so strong okay that will take a bit of uh, economic history and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, probably goes back to 1940s when there was a world war during world war every country fought every other country except america which did not participate in the war it was just on the sidelines watching the war till of course the fag and they come and uh, drop uh, bombs in hiroshima and nagasaki so most of the countries traded their gold with america for steel so america got huge amount of gold at that point in time and by after the war was over and after the collapse of britain america became the preeminent economy the british empire had collapsed and why we are in search of always an empire or a centrifugal force in uh, geopolitics is because most of the geopolitics in the western world is rooted to the roman empire and rome always believed in uh, say 2000 years ago that wherever there is uh, uncertainty wherever there is uh, uh, um, Uh, con- uh, 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 there is some conflict wherever there are people in some unrest it is the duty of the empire to go and settle it so that hegemony thought the uh, the imperial thought flows from the uh, roman empire and the uh, american is a american uh, government believes it's a successor of the roman empire so now come to the currency it was the only currency backed by gold and at that time uh the whole idea was imf world bank w uh, not wto it was actually gat all the three institutions were created for an orderly functioning of world economy and one of the primary thing that was held was that america will have enough gold and every uh, troy ounce will be uh, backed by 31 dollars of uh, gold in other words one troy ounce will cost you 31 dollars now that's how the world world was aligned and the uh, world saw rapid uh, progress between say 45 46 post war yeah so a quick question this was the bretton woods agreement right yeah bretton woods agreement bretton woods agreement. And, exactly and and for our viewers 1 ounce is approximately 31 grams so i yes, guess 31 it's a loose bill yeah 31. so 1 dollar is equal to 1 gram 1 dollar is equal to 1 gram because so that will like give it. you an idea that is 81 rupees to a gram that was the number that was there today probably it is at a much higher level please continue sir yeah, the, uh, so what happened was like all uh, milkmen who first give you uh, full milk uh, for every liter then after 3 months he adds some water and then put some milk and then there is more water and less of milk america started printing more dollars than the troy ounce that they had in their fort knox so they started printing more notes by 60s the french were the first guys to realize it and they started giving the dollars and taking the gold and by 68 it was becoming uh, literally difficult for the american establishment to run the whole show and by 15th august 1971 president nixon declared that from now on dollar will have no link to the gold now you believe in the dollar and you trade by the time by 25 years the world had been hooked on to the dollar and they they thought let us replace it at a later date but let us continue this arrangement with a very important uh, side uh, show, story that it is no longer linked to gold but americans knew very well that the dollar had to be linked to something fundamental so that is why after the gold was delinked they started this opec now what is opec 
Now, oil producing and exporting country, it's a cartel of 10 countries. And they said, let the dollar be sucked in by all these oil producing exporting countries. Now, 190 countries, 200 countries want oil. 10 countries produce oil. So you suck out the dollar from all these 190 countries into these 10 countries. Then you, it is easy for you to manage and manipulate these 10 countries. And then you somehow or other sustain the dollar. This is how doll, petrodollar economics started. This the word is petrodollar economics. Yes. Uh, MRV, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you again and again. But uh, at the turn of independence, 1947, India used to print the currency that was accepted across many of these oil producing states. This was before they discovered uh, oil, of course, black gold, of course. So the Persian Gulf rupee or something like it was Gulf rupee, something like that was called. How did that die? Because that died in, I think, 60s. Yes. So even till 70s, our rupee was uh, held as a valid currency in uh, Dubai and uh, Saudi and many of these Gulf nations. But once they started uh, having oil, they started linking their dinar, their dirhams, their uh, uh, whatever currency was uh, to the dollar. And for example, the, the UAE, uh, UAE uh, currency dirham is linked at 3.74 to a dollar for so many years. So that is how petrodollar came into being, which means all the other currencies were, you know, removed from the radar and petrodollar. So protecting dollar through the petroleum uh, products was the uh, was the economics. So to, if you look into it, even today, the cost of extracting one barrel of oil is around $15. But what do you get it at 70, uh, 80, 80? It is changing from place to place. I'm told Saudi yeah. Arabia, it is less than $7 a barrel. Seven there, there are areas in Russia where it is $2 a barrel. Yes. But I'm giving, I'm giving the, I'm giving the devil all the allowances and putting it at 15. It is trading multiple times 15 in the market. So what it means is we are paying through our nose to the Gulf countries and the Gulf countries in turn, because each one is suspecting the other, you know, Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait was the biggest, the Americans were the biggest beneficiary because it always made one Gulf country suspect the other. And they all in turn parked their excessive riches in the American continent and mostly in America. And America thereby is the largest borrower in the world. So you see the petrodollar cycle, America prints the dollar and it goes to various countries and through petrodollar economics starts to come back to America. Now why American realize this is also not a very infallible uh, practice or an arrangement. So they added something more to it. It is like pizza topping. They add one after the other. So now what they did, what did they do? They did something very, uh, very uh, stunning. When you have to force one Gulf country against the other, one OPEC country against the other, they have to repeatedly show their might. And dollar became the only currency which was backed by the army in recent times, the recent history. So that is why you see that Saddam Hussein could be invaded. And it was telecast live. And that put a fear of God in everybody. You, you saw the you know, shock and awe theory. Every American president, except probably to the exception of Trump, has repeatedly tried to finger other countries and tried to show that the army's prowess. That is not politics. It is economics. And they have played it in full public glare to show people that look, we have got the masculinity of the dollar and that is how dollar is became the preeminent currency. Now, having become the preeminent currency, no, it is also subject to always hits and, and the collapse of the dollar, which will happen. I don't know when, but when it happens, the person who leads the charge will be the new emperor. And Putin believes he is the man who will trip the dollar and he will be the new emperor. And obviously, he is backed by uh, Jin Jinping. Okay. Both these chaps believe that it is their duty 
to collapse the financial arrangement of uh, the modern modern global architecture financial architecture they believe that now this is where it is at this point in time the attack on the dollar is going again and again very heavily but dollar is able to sustain itself but the other currencies which are hooked on to the dollar whether it is the yen the pakistani rupee the yuan the won or the indian rupee or the pakistani or the bangladeshi taka the indonesian rupiah name it everybody is having some threat in the last 6 months and they are seeing that their value is depreciating not that their countries are doing badly it is because the dollar is doing badly so it's a very peculiar thing dollar is doing badly and you are actually uh, forced to depreciate your currency it is like the neighbor not re reading well and you getting lower marks sir you are muted do you know the formula india uses to compute its exchange rate sir see the rbi repeatedly uses the word uh, uh, basket uh, of currencies basket of currencies it uses aphorisms it says we don't believe in uh, uh, it believes in flexible exchange rate mechanism it doesn't talk about a rock solid stable one neither does it talk about a market driven it 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 controlled uh, but it is flexible <laughs> okay yeah, i have to tell you this i have to tell you this there is a mauli drama where the the artist is trying to explain how a tavil looks like tavil is like exactly. sadangam for those of you who yeah. don't know so he is describing it it is uh, it is a round but square yes so exactly that's what i am reminded of yes Uh, it it uh, talks in uh, aphorisms and most central banks talk in such way deliberately vague delightfully vague and they keep it that they can escape from all sides should there be any uh, uh, crisis at a later date and they don't give there is no formula the formula is not to have a formula and and keep it as loose as possible and and looking at hind side when all the currencies have depreciated we some of i i am still not able to understand i'll give you a classical example in the sense uh, this is how we should look at it let us assume we are all on the moon the earth has moved a million kilometers away from the sun now whether it is in the interest of the earth to move million kilometers along with the earth or should it stay the, where it is interest of the moon to move along with the earth i think uh, interest you, you've got yeah, yeah yeah interest of the moon to travel along with the earth a million kilometers so that it can have the same influence parity with the earth it is immediate competitor is the earth its immediate influence a sphere of influence where it uh, creates tides where it gets influenced is the earth now it can show machoism and option and say look i will stay closer to the sun but it will lose its influence along with the earth now let me tell you what it is you are competitors have depreciated their currency china has depreciated indonesia has depreciated pakistan bangladesh all these are your competitors in the global export market they have depreciated their currency you said no i am a macho man i i want to feel good i want to use one barometer that the rupee is strong and i held on at around 78 79 rupees for almost close to 6 8 months what happened in this 6 8 months we have lost somewhere around 80 billion dollars in one year uh, we have lost coming around 100 billion dollars defending the rupee yeah sir quick question hmm our exporters i'm saying what indian exporters are doing the same thing day in and day out what about processes of efficiency i mean why is the exporter indian exporter always reliant on 
the rupee uh, dollar exchange to make himself competitive why can't he control his costs okay uh, one of the biggest costs is your uh, labor costs one of your biggest costs is your oil and fuel taxes all these things are which are indeterminate but but uh, the bigger problem the bigger challenge for the exporter is not his own competitiveness it is the neighbor's competitiveness his pricing which will determine your pricing now if china has devalued its currency by 10% and what was 1 dollar may be exported by china at 90 cents now today you have not depreciated whatever be your efficiency you still will be saying that my cost will be at 1 dollar now the same product let us assume a pen being offered by china at 90 cents and india by 1 dollar people will gravitate towards china no, you should, you have to compete price wise. You can't compete. You will have to sell, find a way to sell at 90 and still make a profit. Right. That's my question. Exactly. exactly. There are two things in work. One is the microeconomics of the firm, which I will be competitive. That's, that's each one's headache. But there is a macroeconomic competitiveness, which is the responsibility of RBI. Now, between 96 and 2006, 10 years, Chinese held their currency at 8.28 to a dollar. The yuan was pegged at 8.28 to a dollar. And they that was the time when China leapfrogged. Now, when, when, when an exporter exports, he would like to get 82 rupees today to a dollar. But suddenly if it comes to say 72 rupees, the, the exporter will lose around 15%. And that is what worries every exporter. India must have a more rigid and a steady exchange rate. Probably hold on to it for five, eight years. It's easier said and done because macroeconomics, you can't have a very rigid exchange rate without uh, uh, taking care of inflation. See, our problem was had we allowed rupee to depreciate further. Already inflationary pressures were built up and exports, when you give more uh, incentive to exports, it will a weak rupee is always a, a, a trigger for inflation. So RBA was caught in a, a dilemma, whether to depreciate, whether not to depreciate. Other countries were depreciating. Other countries were uh, taking a calculated risk. Nobody can say that this is the way to economic nirvana. And every country took a calculated risk, allowed their currencies to depreciate. And when they allow their currencies to depreciate, let us not uh, deprecate them. Let us not say we are doing relatively better. We are intelligent people. They are fools. No, every central banker has its own macroeconomic calculation. They believe that if they depreciate by 10, 15 percent, they will manage inflation. They will manage the reserves. They will give uh, uh, exports uh, that much amount of uh, leeway. They will prevent imports. They will manage their fuel costs. So many calculus goes into fixing an exchange rate. Now, some some take it. Some have taken a leap of faith. Like China has also depreciated. Uh, Japan has depreciated significantly. But we, for some reason, have believed that um, it is not a very healthy way. And I think uh, somewhere down the line, uh, the right wingers think a strong rupee is indicative of a strong economy. I think. It, it may be indicative, but it is not necessary. You can still have a strong currency and a weak economy. You can have a weak, a weak currency and a strong economy. Uh, it's not a necessary precondition. If we come out of it and look at exchange rates as dispassionately, rather than trying to uh, link it to any political fortunes or, or performance of the economy on the whole, in the aggregate, I think we'll do uh, a, a great service to economic dialogues. Thank you so much, Dr. MRV. I'm going to give you a clear and present problem today, which is going yeah. to make the inflation shoot up in India. Just yesterday, we read that the natural gas is going to cost 40% more. And I'm assuming that 40% rise will be reflected in the price of a cylinder that every household uses, practically every household uses now. If you have a basic component like that being charged 40% more, then that will start rippling through all your other prices. Yes. Um, is, is there anything that the Indian government could have done to try and alleviate this challenge? See, uh, Indian uh, government for the last three, four years have stuck gold with the revenues 
especially from oil and GST. And they believe that uh, it is their uh, fundamental right and duty, right and duty, I use the word, to probably milk the last uh, rupee out of every Indian on these products. And they think that there will be enormous money in the hands of the government. And they see political reason why there must be money in the hands of the government so that these welfare schemes and other things can go on. So uh, they have also done their own political matrix and they believe that inflation up to 8-9% uh, will not hurt their political fortunes and they believe that uh, let all this uh, talk in uh, um, the drawing rooms about inflation and other things uh, be there but we will manage it because that's still not hurting our political fortunes. See the even the Congress party, the opposition party has not taken inflation very seriously and uh, discussed this in either the parliament or outside the parliament in any significant manner because the problem with the uh, opposition in this country is that they have completely become uh, sterile. They, 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 they are completely out of touch with what's happening. So the political equation if it is manageable, government is taking that much elbow room on inflation and playing this game. So to answer to your question is government knows that there is inflation. Government believes it is not hurting it politically. And like all politicians, unless it starts hurting politically, there is no answer to it unless it starts hurting politically. Thank you very much, Dr. MRV. So I'm going to kind of hone in on this a little bit more. The lack of opposition to any policy. There are two challenges as I see it, uh, Dr. MRV. First of all, even if somebody raises a protest, they don't have the numbers with them to kind of bring everybody in on the same page and then articulate it and say, look, this is where the problem is so that they can put pressure on the government. The second problem that I see is the intellectual gravitas required to understand and articulate and enunciate the problems that a, a country like India, which is now very tightly tied with the global economy is. I see that missing. It doesn't matter which party. The politician in India today is more worried about winning his next election, his or her next election, than in understanding how these currents blow, what needs to be done, and, and how should the country as a whole respond. So you're saying that there may be buffers built up because of the fact that India got oil cheap, and maybe they'll use some of that to kind of ease the pain on the natural gas. Because I'm back to the price thing on the cylinder. If, if, yeah, again, coming back to this issue about uh, gas pricing and other things, uh, they they are very certain, especially an election to Gujarat is around the corner in a couple of uh, months, probably uh, weeks, eight, ten weeks, we will have a Gujarat election. And then we have the uh, Karnataka election. Then we have the three elections to the states of Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, and Chhattisgarh. So the, the calendar for the next 12 months is almost filled with elections. And then, of course, that's the home run for the uh, uh, Lok Sabha elections in 2023, 24. So now the point is, is it that the government not aware about this thing? Government is very much aware about these things. They believe, see, every government knows there is no ideal situation to work out certain macroeconomic uh, uh, workings. You know, they have to pinch here and there. And they think that 40% pinch, if you call it one, 40% hike as a pinch. They think that today's electorate is not in a mood to punish the sitting government at the center for this hike. And they believe that they can get away with it. That's the answer to that. Well, it's um, see what, what happens is there's a trickle up effect. Um, maybe the government has done a better job now managing the trickle up effect than what used to be the case because there's so much more computerization and other things involved. But let us take a look at the Indian economy. Now, one of the things that India did that uh, or did not do that the rest of the world did was during the COVID phase, especially in the 2020 from March up until like the next six months to nine months, everybody did their own quantitative easing. I'm not sure India did that. If I did I mean, please set me right. I think they did not because they did not come to the aid of the middle income employee. Fixed incomes, fixed expenditures, pops, expenditures are going up. How does the government expect to see the middle class, which is the bulk of the voter, come and vote for them in 2024? Okay. Uh, let me put this, uh, uh, let me first explain quantitative easing and its downsides. And then we'll come yeah, to... There's only downsides. But if everybody does it and you don't do it, 
Tell me that. Okay. <laughs> I don't think so. We have not done that. Mm. We have also done that, but in a different way. I'll explain that. Uh, first thing is quantitative easing. Uh, this uh, this new word called quantitative easing, this new elephant in the town, uh, entered our drawing room somewhere in 2008-2009 after the global economic crisis. At that time, what happened was uh, America saw, saw virtue in housing uh, boom. They thought that they must allow every Tom, Dick and Harry in America to own a house. And President Bush's theory was that to allow everybody to own a house. And everybody went and purchased a house way beyond their means from the bank. They got rated and those uh, loans were uh, marketed to other people also as some sort of derivatives. And uh, the world was gaga about it, sanguine about it, and everybody was happy. Till they realized that Tom, Dick and Harry, who owed money to the bank, did not have money in the first place to buy such an expensive asset. So what happened? The whole economy started tanking. And that is how the global economic crisis started. Supposing I am going to buy Mukesh Ambani's house of... Uh, uh, two and a half billion dollars. I don't have money, but my bank says I will give you money. You go and purchase that house. Let me assume that I purchase that house. Next mo next month EMI will be a couple of hundred uh, crores. Where do I go for it? I don't have that money, and so the bank then doesn't know what to do. That loan paper was in turn given to the U.S. Federal Reserve. The U.S. Federal Reserve gave money to the bank. It said, "Okay, MRV is insolvent. MRV cannot pay pay this EMI, but what we do?" We give you money and we give you dollars and we purchase that loan papers. That is how U.S. Federal Reserve, instead of being the lender of the lost resort, became the lender of the first resort and the, it started pumping dollars into the economy. And believe it or not, dollar was now backed by the earning ability of every Tom, Dick and Harry in the U.S. That is how quantitative easing started. That I will put money, I will put liquidity into the system to solve the individual insolvency issue. And this happened. Everybody was happy because more money started flowing. Economy started uh, coming up. Everybody was so gaga about it. Stock market started again booming. You had this um, uh, uh, bond markets booming. You had uh, GDP growth uh, starting up. So everybody was gaga about it. Everybody was so happy about it, except people like me were repeatedly pointing out that in, in Tamil, the word for economics is Puruladhar. Purul Adharam. The, uh, you, your basis is Purul, meaning material. Your Sanskrit word for economics is Artha Shastra. Artha Shastra, meaning material sciences. You didn't have anything. Your economics was now based on only one premise. How much notes could you print and who could buy that notes? Who could take that notes with a belief that it has a value? So to ensure the belief is sustained over a period of time, you sent armies, you did this, you did that. So you, your calculation was not on the economy. Calculation was the perception management about the dollar that it is the strongest currency. Now we have talked about how Putin is challenging this. Now, when too much of money got printed, and as you said, Mr. Ayer, during the COVID, everybody was handled uh, through $3,000 or $5,000 in US. Several, several countries did this and handed it over to people and said, this is happening, this is happening, go and spend, go and spend. In fact, in 2001, 9-11, when 9-11 happened, President Bush said to the Americans, go shop and drop till uh, you shop, you know, you go and uh, shop till you drop. No, that, that's the idea. You're muted, sir. And shop till you drop. Yeah, that is what he said. So now th this way of spending, this you go on spending and you spend your way to richness and that will make America prosperous is one idea of uh, in economics that has run its full course. Now you have too much money circulating and too little goods. COVID created too much of manufacturing bottlenecks, scarcity and so many things happened. Things are not there. And there is too much of money floating. And when too much of money floating, America is now worried about inflation. Britain is worried about inflation. Uh, the whole of Northern Europe is worried about inflation. For the last 30, 40 years, they thought that they have slaughtered the monster called inflation. Two or three percent would be the rate of inflation. And they were so happy about it for the last 30, 40 years. In fact, in my belief, if you ask a young economist about inflation in these uh, countries, he would have very little understanding of this issue called inflation. 
because there is so much of prosperity, so much of goods flowing, currencies managed very well. Everything was going on well. But now they are doing what is called as quantitative uh, tightening. That is taking back the money and they are giving the bonds and other things. They are, they are taking back and saying that please take these bonds, which they took it from Tom, Dick and Harry, which nobody wants to take also. So the world has come to a full circle. Quantitative easing has failed several of these countries by too much by pumping in too much of uh, currency and a very heavy inflation is now compelling these countries to raise their uh, interest rates. Once they raise their interest rate, they believe that uh, dollar will come back to America, the respective currencies will come back. But you saw that pound uh, sterling tanking. Now it is pound sterling which is tanking. And now you see the euro tanking. So all these currencies are under gas track. As far as we are concerned, Mr. Ayer, we did not use the monetary route. We used the fiscal route. In the eight years of Modi government, the debt of government of India has gone up from 55 lakh crores to 140 lakh crores. That's now, a huge number, sir. That's a huge number. Somebody, yes. Nobody has mentioned it this far. Yes. The, the, and now, I will give you some more shocking news about this. Now, 15th, uh, let us say 25th of May 2014, out of this 55 lakh crores debt of the central government, roughly 60% would be without assets. Now the debt, if I even have a debt of say 100 crores and an asset of 100 crores, it's still acceptable. But if I have 100 crores of debt and 40 crores of assets, and I hope to garner income from this 40 crores to service the debt of 100 crores. I am in huge trouble. India today from 55 crores has jumped to close to 140 crores. And that 140 crores, the my calculation about the assets uh, not being, uh, liability not being represented by assets will be 67% now. Close to 90 crores of uh, liability is not represented by assets. So India has spent where your revenue deficits the last eight years have been significant because you have done enormous welfare. The 9% uh, revenue deficit of 21-22 all reflects the fact that we have spent huge uh, money on maintaining our poor welfare scheme, all those goody goody things that we have done. We have not put directly, there is no direct benefit scheme like what we did for the West, but we did through a sustained program which is basically targeted at the poor and subsidized. For instance, your own food, even, uh, even yesterday the Prime Minister announced that the free food scheme goes up to December. Obviously, the Gujarat elections, he doesn't want to upset the apple cart, so it, uh, it's extended till uh, December. So that means somewhere around 50, 60,000 crores of expenditure. So, um, how come the people in Congress government, there, are, there were finance ministers there. In fact, I would call one of them as an evil genius. How come this evil genius is not saying anything about this? See, the problem with the Congress is it has lost both the credibility and the mojo to take anything on this government. Now, if Congress is going to start asking about why, why, why the debt has gone about uh, from 55 lakh crores to 140 lakh crores, uh, the first thing that the Congress has to answer what it did from uh, 2004 to 2014 when it would have gone up from say 25 lakh crores to 55 lakh crores. So 25 to 55 looks smaller compared to 55 to 150, 140. But the fact of the matter is it is two and a half, uh, two, 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 uh, two something uh, times of what it was at the base uh, in 2004. The same thing is done by the BJP. So as far as the macroeconomics is concerned, I will make a bet that in terms of management of the economy, there is hardly a distinction between the BJP and the uh, Congress. Now, read any budget of say Jitli ji or uh, uh, Nirmala ji or Chidambaram ji or Pranam Mukherjee, you will see that virtually it is one and the same, except for the numbers and uh, and probably Chidambaram would quote from Tirupural, 
Okay. Uh, 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 Mukherjee would be quoting from Tagore. The distinction is only in ornamentation, not in any substantive one. For example, you say that uh, people have not been put money in the in the hands of the people. What is Mandrega doing? But that is not helping the middle class. No, that the Mandrega is not. See, you are. Yeah, that is what it, the definition of middle class in India is different from what it is say in America. Indian middle class is the middle class that goes for Mandrega. Please understand. Your, your definition or the government thinks politically, you may disagree with me, you may agree with me. But what I'm saying is, government believes middle class definition means people who go to Mandrega. And I have helped the people who are standing in the queue there. And that is reflected. Now, whether Mandrega translates into electoral fortunes, there is no study correlation. Because there are states where you lose elections because Mandrega has done well. There are states you have lost elections because Mandrega has done badly. There is no correlation uh, study. But remember, the BJP which lampooned Mandrega, the Prime Minister is on record on the floor of the house to say, Tindora Peet ke mai ye smarak jita jata smarak rakhunga. Meaning, he in will Dandora. with Tendora, with all pomp and glory, he will retain Mandrega as a memorial of the failure of economic policies of the Congress government. And that's a very clever way of putting it. But no government can roll back Mandrega. No government can roll back this free food scheme. You mean to say it will go back in December? 80 crore people who are entitled to some 7 kilos of ration. Will it go back by December? No way. Because the next election is in uh, uh, January, February, March. Something will crop up. There will be uh, Mizoram, Manipur, Karnataka. We don't know. I don't recall which are the elections which are coming in. So, so we are in a constant uh, democratic process. We require these welfare schemes politically. But it has a huge impact on the fisc. And that is why I say each country has its own currency crisis. Okay. Um, up or down, what is your thought about India's economy? Because if you see today, there's okay, maybe before we go to India, economy, one small thing. Today, there is a tweet saying China is beginning preparing to offload the dollar massively. Mm. Do you think that will put pressure on the exchange rate of the dollar to all the other currencies? What do you think is going to happen? See, again, as I said, China in uh, doing this um, dumping of the dollars, if I can call one, if they, they have the wherewithal to dump because I think they're close to $2.5 trillion to $3 yeah. trillion. They have, they're sitting on $3 trillion. Yeah. Now, they can afford $500 billion. Okay, but what will what will they get out? What will if I give five hundred billion dollars? What is China going to get? Is it going to get California? Is it going to get Mexico, or is it going to get American uh, treasury bonds? I am going to put this money into the bond market, and I will get some. I'll give one tissue paper and exchange it with another tissue paper. So that is why I believe the Chinese, whether they believe in the God or not. They have to daily pray before the non-existent God and say that dollar must be sustained. Because if dollar loses its value, America will be happy. It has nothing because it is, understand one thing, this is the US Treasury uh, Secretary stating this in somewhere in 80s. I forgot the name of the gentleman, but he said a very prophetic one. Uh, he said dollar is America's currency. It is global responsibility. You have to maintain American dollar. India has got a responsibility to maintain it 82. Supposing it comes to 60 or 40 and the dollar collapses and your, your rupee rises to 40. What will happen? The entire economy, your exports, you know, there will be so much of chaos in the Indian market. Which we are not prepared. RBI, you tell the RBI what, will, what it has to do 
when the rupee drops from 80 to 100, they got a solid book. Okay. Food Corporation of India, if you tell, Food Corporation of India, mark this word. Tomorrow there is a crisis, there is a famine in India. We are producing 300 million uh, tons, but we will produce only 200 million tons this year. We will expect a shortfall of 100 million tons. Food Corporation of India has got a manual to manage this famine crisis. But tell Food Corporation, this year we expect a bumper crop of 400 million instead of 300 million. We will have excess 100 million tons of food grains. Food Corporation of India will have no answer. RBI will have no answer should the rupee jump from 80 to say 40. And so will be the case with several of these uh, economies. Because they have all been addicted to a strong dollar and their weak domestic currency. They see virtues in weak currency. And they are not emotional about it. Have you ever seen a Japanese Prime Minister lamenting that the N is weak? Or the opposition leader? If tomato goes at 20 and if it goes to 60, there are people who will benefit at 20, there are people who will benefit at 60. It depends. So dollar at 80 or dollar at 40, there is going to be huge amount of matrix that has to be drawn in. And there will be beneficiaries, there will be losers. But people who are benefiting it at 80 will be the people who will lose when it is at 40. And people who are losing at 40 will be the gainers at when it is at 80. It goes back and forth. How much of the Indian economy is the export as a percentage? 10%? 20%? I don't think so. We are more than... Our exports are 300 billion, 350 billion. Huh, 10% we can say. So you are diluting your rupee for the 10% loud mouths. Sorry to say that because they always scream loudly. And you are shortchanging the entire 90%. Yeah, this is the uh, this is the pressure created by probably the software lobby. This is the pressure created by probably the lobbies of exports of certain gems, jewelries. These are the guys who are going on saying. But believe me, if the rupee goes to 40, you still have a benefit that you 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 may lose many of the software growth. You may lose so many things, but your petrol will be cheaper. Your diesel may be cheaper. Inflation comes down. You have a new matrix that will work out. All right, sir. The, we are just, I'm, I'm just, you know, uh, dumbstruck by the fact that the 10% is wagging the tail of the 90%. That's all. That's my limited point. Okay. So moving forward, tailwind or headwinds for Indian economy? See, both, both are, uh, see, today we are in one. So if you get point. tailwinds and headwinds, you're going to yaw. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, 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 that I understand that, but metaphorically, I said uh, it, it has both challenges and it has got some sweet spot. Let me first put the sweet spot. We are growing at around 7%. We started saying that the beginning of the year will grow at 8, 8.5. And, and that uh, you must remember 2021 was a washout. So statistically, it is irrelevant. 21, 22, first three months were again a washout. We started crawling back from the second quarter. And by the fourth quarter, we did reasonably well. But there is a structural weakness. We are not able to go beyond 8.5% this year, even on a weaker base of last year. So our growth is to that extent, 7% is not impressive. And yesterday or day before, the RBI has come out with the numbers that it expects the growth to be 7%. Just lowered the growth rate. Now, if the middle of the year, you grow, lower the growth rate, uh, it, despite the fact you had an excellent monsoon, uh, and and we had we had by and large uh, uh, good manufacturing pickup. We still are not in some sweet spot in terms of going up to eight and a half percent. Why that is happening is capex spending is not happening. And we had uh, Nirmala ji coming and asking the captains of the Indian industry why is it that the uh, capex is not happening. Capex is not happening because they still have capacity which was built some years back. Why did why is it that not transforming? Because the man, the middle class, the so-called middle class is not having money in his pocket. There is too much of taxes being collected. There is too much of, uh, uh, shall I say, uh, difficulty in terms of running your businesses that you are compelled to make so much of. At the end of the day, the 
average middle class or the, or what we call as the consumer class in india let us put it this way the consumer class is finding it difficult to consume you may still say that last month we had the highest number of automobile sales that's a sweet spot but contrast it with the fact that uh, motorbike sales is one of the lowest so there are uh, that's why i say there are headwinds and tailwinds m m uh, cars are going up in india car sales is going up but automobile sales cycle sales which are indicative of your rural economy doing well your your uh, lower middle class doing well all these are actually throwing signs which are not very comfortable so you you uh, world will also have to look at where to park their money now india is one where there is a reasonable performance of our stock market the corporates are doing very well and they are sitting in piles of cash but they are not investing the corporate cash uh, aggregate is one of the highest in recent time somewhere i thought uh, 12 lakh crores is what uh, some studies uh, put it in. but they are not going and buying machinery they are not buying land they are not buying capital equipment they are not investing in technology they are sitting back and selling the same thing that they were selling say 6 years back why because they don't feel that the new technology or new products or new uh, number of goods will entice the consumer coming in because the consumer is doing more of window shopping rather than genuine shopping that is why the industrialists are not ready to invest dr mrv you've just agreed to my point see the middle class does not get manrega they don't get free rations and and they suffered just as bad as the everybody as everybody else during the covid and yet the modi government continues to ignore them ignore them that's the only way i can put it and now you are wringing your hand saying nobody is buying new uh, vehicles they don't have any money they have yes. set expenditures their children are going to colleges they are sending them to abroad perhaps and and they don't have the money how i mean what did the, what did this government think about we've been saying this from pillar to post dr mrv sorry to go on a rant here but i've said this thing for close to 2 years ever since the thing began i extol the virtues of how it uh, the american government giving this something called ppp payment protection plan for about 3 months just 3 months march april may those 3 months it really really helped and they, they made it for one more set of 3 months but that time they reduced the window to only a few and then they took it off so that that helped the middle class companies otherwise you would have had a total collapse of even the companies that were you know working in uh, in united states and india somehow india has managed to pull through i don't know what jugaad the middle class has done i i tip my hat to all the middle class people because nobody is enjoying this 7% growth just my two cents sir please feel free to comment see the uh, definition of middle class in america is different uh, you have to be very no no that okay that's okay no, i understand the, the middle okay. class as i see it are the ones that are paying taxes before they even earn their money so if if 2% of your population is paying taxes okay and you don't expect the government to go back and give them back the taxes and say that this is what we are going to help them though ideally this is the this is the way it should have been uh uh i my guess is 23 or 24 modi would try to give a massive tax reduction because uh we are seeing whatever be the state of economy there is a huge buoyancy in revenue both direct and gst both are just being buoyant in fact the six months that we had this year uh we had something like 30% more than last year collection of uh, gst and uh, uh, sorry the entire taxes so that's that's amazing we are we are doing extraordinary well on taxes and despite collecting so much of taxes we are also borrowing so much money from the public and continuing our welfare now where does that welfare go where does it actually translate into action is a billion dollar question several schemes floated by the uh, government namami gange skill india make in india 5 trillion dollar economy coastal shipping you name anything uh, is uh, the low cost housing then uh, smart city all these are on paper till date we are not seeing them getting translated into action now if you ask me personally whether it is uh, advisable to start a manufacturing uh, from a uh, 
greenfield in india i would always think that it is it is india may be one of the destination but not the pristine destinations because india has its own problems uh, in terms of even today our labor laws are very dodgy our tax laws are very complicated gst believes every single person who raises a gst invoice to be a scoundrel unless proved otherwise so if these type of laws that you have uh, we are in for massive trouble in terms of being an investigating uh, investigating uh, investing destination see again you are showing me that gst receipt surge in september to 1.48 lakh crores it's phenomenal again that's why i'm saying we are collecting too much of taxes from the hands of the public it's time the government must think about reducing the mean rate of uh, gst from 18% to 16% it must think about a quantum leap in uh, direct taxes by say up to 10 lakhs no uh, income tax uh, when you collect more than uh, when you have an income of more than 10 lakhs you start paying tax i think government must take a quantum leap on all these things and do it Sir, you are muted, sir. Again. So what you are saying, I'm sorry. Uh, so what you are saying is relief, if that comes to the middle class, will come in the form of a tax benefit that the ceiling will be raised to. I think right now it's at eight, eight lakhs taxable income. That might go no, up. Maybe. No, 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 no. It starts with two and a half lakhs. There is enough complications in that. So I don't want to give any advice as a chartered accountant yeah. uh, to say that up to eight lakhs. There's no. It it is depend on several ifs. Okay. If you invest in PPF, if you do this, if you do that, if you have a, a mentally retarded person in your house, you take ATU, you take ATG, all these type of calculations, and then probably you may end up at 80, uh, 8 lakh rupees. So why not completely do away with personal income tax? You have corporate taxes. GST is pretty streamlined. Why not do away with personal income tax? See, the uh, idea of doing away with personal income tax will be seen as something uh, absolutely elitist. You will be seen as somebody who is favoring the richest 2% of the Indian population. No prime minister is going to do it. Let me assure you, sir, even if I become the prime minister, it will be very difficult for me to take that call. Because the entire country will be telling you that you are actually helping those who are owning Mercedes Benz, the houses, the BMWs the best of vehicles a tax break no prime minister will be ready to do it instead he would he would collect that four to five lakh crores from the richest people and then say that i announced this program and that program whether that program succeeds or not is an entirely different question because everybody uh, talks about say uh, this um, uh, smart city where is i am repeatedly asking every single person to show me one square inch of smart city I'm not asking one smart city. I'm saying one square inch of smart city. I have not seen it for eight years. We have spent some 60, 80,000 crores, probably six, eight lakh crores in the last eight years. We don't see anything. And if you take Skill India, where is the person who comes and says, I'm a Skill India product. I was skilled in this particular thing and I have done this. Low cost housing, you're supposed to eradicate your uh, uh, entire bastis, the slums in cities. Tell me one slum in Chennai or one slum in Mumbai that has vanished in the last eight years because of low cost housing. Okay, so sir. Is, yeah, so go you ahead. Go ahead. The of it is. Unless somebody starts questioning on all these things, whether you, you, I don't mind paying taxes moderately, provided I see smart cities. Yesterday, it took almost two hours for me to travel 20 kilometers in Chennai last evening. And Chennai is, Chennai CMDA has uh, thought it is Chennai Metropolitan Digging Authority. And it has gone about digging every damn road across the length and breadth of the city. Forget motorable, it is it is unwalkable. So we, we don't, see the point is I don't mind paying taxes. And yesterday somebody was pointing out traveling from Chennai to Velour takes five hours because the roads are awful. The highways are awful. And they are toll, toll roads. It's a complete collapse. 
and we are still 30 days away from the monsoon. Well, uh, I, I don't know whether we had a discussion that says that good things are going to happen in India or bad things. I guess there's an equal measure of both. Now let's take some questions for Dr. M. R. Venkatesh. Here we go. Yeah. All about climate change and nations. Are U.S. oil reserves exhausted? See, the last that I could uh, read about it was it has reached a lowest point, but they have not exhausted. Nobody will exhaust it. Uh, they will keep some reserves that maybe economic reserves are uh, probably touched. Uh, security reserves and military reserves will may, may not be touched. So that, that we need to distinguish. Um, before I read the next question, I want to explain something to our friend who asked this question. Hmm. U.S. made it a policy to not really scout for oil other than what has happened in Texas. They have huge deposits of their yes. coast on both Pacific as well as Atlantic. Huge deposits. And they said, we'll wait till the world exhausts itself of the oil and then we will start doing it. Already they are drilling in Alaska and, and Texas. And now shale has started. Shale has been done in a couple of states, Texas. And, and in some northeastern states and in the North Dakota. Um, shale is a very expensive process, but they have worked on the efficiencies. The extraction cost is now at $30 a barrel or somewhere in that ballpark. You have still uh, Saudi oil coming in at $7 a barrel. Some say that Russia can give you $2 a barrel. So unless this goes up and shale continues to go down, US will wait it out. He is not going to drill in of its Pacific coast or the Atlantic coast, you, you have a lot of conservationists will be applying pressure. That's something that California has been known for. So whatever we say about California being woke is not something that is last 10 years old. It is last 60 years old. It started with a hippie culture. Anyway, my two cents. Let's go to the next question. Same person. Have China ever faced any oil crisis before throughout history? Now, I'm not an expert on Chinese and much less on Chinese economic crisis, much less on Chinese oil crisis. Uh, but what I understand is China doesn't have any economic crisis. It has huge financial crisis at this point in time. And um, their banks are extremely dodgy. Their uh, uh, loans given for building houses is uh, running its full course and they are having huge uh, problems on that. So I don't think so. China has faced any oil crisis. And uh, I think they get good amount of oil from Russia. Anything you want to add, Mr. Raya, you can add. Um, you, you have things moving in a different way in, in China. You know, people use the public transport a lot. And uh, for uh, bullet trains and other things, which is electricity driven, they're using coal based uh, power plants. So uh, in terms of the petroleum usage, it's not as, you know, as much as in India. See, this is a good thing about India. Even people who used to bike to work, bicycle to work, are now using two wheelers. It's more convenient. So that upward mobility of everybody has happened in India. It has probably not happened in China. China's poor continues to be dirt poor. And, and there's a very, very big chasm that exists between its middle class and its lower classes. And, and this is only going to get worse because People have been, you know, uh, what do you call it? Zero COVIDed out. Everything mm. is sealed and, and not people are not being allowed to move from, you know, one region to another region. So China is on the verge of collapse. By the way, 6 p.m. tonight, there will be an update on China as well as Russia-Ukraine war uh, from Elmer Yuan. Do tune in for that. It will air at 6 p.m. today. Samir 11S wants to know, can you please explain why dollar is doing badly? No, dollar is not doing badly. It cannot be doing badly quite so because one dollar is always equivalent to one dollar. In fact, it is doing well qua other currencies. So please understand, whenever there is an economic crisis in US, it's called global economic crisis. Whenever there is a terrorist attack in uh, America, it's called global terrorism. Whenever there is a financial crisis in America, it's called global financial crisis. So Americans have conflated themselves to the globe. And that's why I said they still believe that they are remnants of the uh, Roman Empire. 
Yes, sir. I have a claimer, not a disclaimer. I have a claimer. Dr. MRV is Professor RV student. Please continue. Yeah, I, I, I am. And these are things that he has taught us. No, he has used this a lot. That's why. <laughs> and, and if you look at it, at every twist and turn, America, and that is the reason for it, I'm taking you uh, a bit uh, more logically, is that America sees itself as a remnant of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire thought that the centrifugal force and the central force, the centripetal force, is within itself. It doesn't think of the rest of the world. It thinks that Rome is the world. And the rest may exist, may not exist. Likewise, Americans do believe that. So th there is no way that the dollar will do badly. Please understand this. What it may be that the American economy may be doing badly. But if they have insulated the dollar from the American economy. If the American economy does not import goods from India, Indian economy manufacturing will have its own. Let us assume Tirupur t-shirts are not getting exported to America. Tirupur's economy will go down. To that extent, our earning in dollars will go down. To that extent, our rupee will go down with the dollar. But dollar will not go down. So they have created this very uh, brilliantly. Unless the dollar is replaced by something else. It is like saying that the solar system must have a new sun. And and it, and and uh, and that's that's very difficult to even imagine. And the sun must be of the same size and same thing that it will continue to dominate the other solar system, uh, the other planets, and the planets will circulate around the sun. They will have the satellites which will circulate around the planets. All these things will take enormous time, and Putin is aiming for that. Putin and Xi Jinping are aiming for that. Whether they will succeed or not, I don't know. But as I said, the man who does that is going to rewrite the global financial architecture. And when you say global financial architecture, it may mean also that uh, Moscow will be the new place where you will get the Nobel Prize. Okay. In instead of Oscars at uh, Los Angeles, you will have Oscars at Beijing. So you will have to think about a tectonic shift worldwide into a something new. It's not so easy. Because you have created a system and we are all hooked and addicted both to the system. So the reality about what he just said, Samir, uh, Professor Arvi has told once in a hangout, out of $100 printed, 60 are outside of the United States. That means every country outside of US believes more in the dollar than its own currency, including India. This perhaps will give you a clue that what, what about the alternate sun concept that uh, Dr. MRV was mentioning. Thank you, Dr. MRV. That's a good, that's a good example. <laughs> Devabrata Biswas wants, to, Biswas wants to know, why is the INR USD at 80 and not 100? Exports will be stronger. There is no reason for defending INR and uh, lose dollar 100 plus. Lose 100 billion dollars. That's what he means. Mm -hmm. Sir, if you go to 100 rupees to a... Uh, dollar probably your petrol prices will be 140 yep so are you and that's the direct that? cost then you have indirect cost four times on all the other things pulses cereal everything goes up everything so your uh, pulses which you get at 80 rupees you may get it at 120 rupees so you have to be very careful when you there <laughs> not are to wish for it <laughs> not to wish for it and you must also understand the uh, the corporate balances which balance sheets which have taken loans in foreign exchange, have to provide for it under the accounting standards to the new rates. Suppose they have taken a loan at say 100 million at 80 rupees. If the dollar appreciates to 100 rupees, they will have to provide for 20 rupees extra per every dollar that they have purchased in their balance sheet as a loss. So balance sheet will take a huge hit. If balance sheets take a huge hit, then, then you will have a problem with the uh, uh, stock market. So it will have a cascading effect on several things. So it is it is very easy for us to say if you drop the dollar or the rupee from 80 to 100, it will benefit exports, surely, but not necessarily. But what would happen to the other is issues, petrol to so many other things is unimaginable. The experts at RBI are working out at a matrix. Now, you may disagree with them as I, as I do. But I wouldn't say that they are doing it out of sheer ignorance. They have their own compulsion. They know much more data. They have their much more uh, uh, 
uh, you know, calculations and computations that go into these things. And probably they are taking a very sober and a very subtle uh, route rather than anything dramatic. Steel plant Babai wants to know, can our RBI manipulate the exchange rate arbitrarily? Sir, it's not possible to do it arbitrarily. What do you mean by exchange rate arbitrarily? No, no, let us go into the question. Can it drop 30% and say that, look, I have done 30% depreciation of the rupee? Uh, like what we did in 91-92 when uh, Manmohan Singh. At that time, it was hailed as a reform. Now, please understand, a 20% drop in the exchange rate in 1991. Manmohan Singh, ji, when he did it, it is hailed as a reform and you have credited him. It's something stupendous. What a brilliant move. Okay. But today, when the rupee is allowed to depreciate by itself with RBI, you are lampooning and saying that, no, you want a stronger rupee. So please understand that the rupee's strength is not only dependent on itself or the American economy. There is a third unhindered factor, unhinged factor or a hinged factor, which is the currency rates of several other countries, including your corp, uh, your uh, uh, your basket of currencies. And every time the RBA calculates whether it has the real, what is called the real, real, real effective exchange rate, of the rupee has strengthened or weakened and then they come to a conclusion whether they are to depreciate or not and they keep it within that range. Santosh Bandur wants to know, oil prices are increasing. How can government allow for depreciation if uh, this will lead to inflation beyond 10%? Yes, this may be the worry. Again, as I said, up to 8%, the inflation may be a tolerant one. But going to double digit inflation, it becomes uh, politically very sticky. And even Modi may fail it, very uncomfortable to answer. So probably they will try to ma maintain it below 8%. So that is why they are holding on to the exchange rate and they will. And But one good thing for this government is the economy has picked up. So there is a headroom available to the government to cut fuel taxes. But I don't know for what reason they are not cutting it. Are the oil bonds paid up from the UP era? Sir, there is no clear answer to that because everybody gives his own statistics. I would love the government to come with a very clear white paper on this. Yeah. How much? Because I, every time I see even the ministers of the government giving various statistics, which is not reconciling. Broadly, it is not reconciling. So unless uh, probably the revenue secretary may be well advised to give a complete white paper as to what was the borrowing done on the oil bonds by the UPA era, how much interest has accrued on each year, how much was there at the close of the year? And by 2014, what was the aggregate number? And how did the unwinding happen? And how much we have paid for it? So long and short of it is, this government, if it claims to have paid out of the oil bonds, what is the pending still? How much is pending? I don't know. Now, nobody gives me a clear answer on this. So I would, I would be hesitant in the absence of any authentic data to actually speak about it. Thank you, Dr. Amarvi. I'm shooting darts at you. I, I realize that, but you have been doing a good job of defending them all. Uh, at least defending them, at least answering them. I'm not saying this is not a batsman bowler kind of thing. Um, troll face wants to know, let's say inflation has gone up by 6% and then to reduce it, repo rate needs to be more than the inflation rate, for example, 7%. I, I don't know what the question is. Troll face, can you... Can you no, no, what he ahead? says is probably he says that the repo rate has not gone up to that level. So why is it the repo rate has not been, uh, see, it need not be, see, these are all, uh, these are all technicalities on which the RBI probably has its own uh, way of looking at it. Now, the 6% is not an uh, inflation rate annualized basis. This is basically inflation on a week to week basis uh, com uh, 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 computed. So RBI in most, is shown in a most favorable light, let's put it that uh, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah obviously. So, but if you rate in, in, uh, interest rates beyond a point, you may slay the monster of inflation. But look at it. Today's middle class is hooked on to EMI. The EMI goes up. And you have very little purchasing power after you pay your EMI, after you pay all your uh, taxes. You have very little to spend. And at, this, at, at that date, you won't have any growth. So, the pay, you will have a very, very good inflation rate controlled at 3%. But you won't have growth. Growth will come down to 3%. Now, I would prefer a growth to be at 7-8%, inflation at even 5-6%. I don't mind that. That would give more buoyancy to the economy, more uh, uh, 
liquidity and more uh, incentive to spend. So you have to see that from all sides, from the consumer side, from the investor side, from the lender side, whether this will balance out in the aggregate. If it balances out, nothing like it. Otherwise, government has to see where it has to interfere and see that the whole thing works seamlessly and smoothly. Next question, please. Uh, viewers, please don't uh, uh, send in more questions. I don't think we'll be able to work through even the ones that we have. Quite a few questions. MRV, this is really <laughs> challenging you on all you learned in the last 30, 40 years. Next one from Ashutosh Kumar. What will be the consequences of falling of Europe and America into recession to India and the world? See, there are people like Raghuram Rajan who believes that India must commit sati if there is going to be recession in Europe or America. Now, why should we bother about recession in America and Europe? If there is a recession, it will have any, as Mr. Ayer said, it's an interconnected world. There will be huge amount of impact. But what makes India recession proof? See, please understand we are recession proof. Once our summer months are over, say up to June, and the sowing season starts, our economy has a full-fledged activity till, say, February or March of next year. We have either sowing season happening, then we have harvest season coming in. Once the harvest comes in, we have festivals beginning with Vinayak Chaturthi onwards till Diwali, till Christmas, till Pongal. We celebrate and you go to any of the sh shops which are uh, retailing on uh, either consumer durables or clothing in Chennai. You see people completely lined up because whether they have money or not, they believe they have to spend. That is the beauty of that is why economics diverse from culture and civilization is no economics. And that is what makes Indian economy completely uh, recession proof. People may spend 200 rupees, people may spend 500 rupees on Diwali, on crackers, on new clothes, on uh, uh, on sweetmeats and whatever they enjoy. New movies, everything goes into adding to the GDP. That means some when you spend, somebody is earning. And when somebody is earning, he is going to spend. And he is compelled to spend. That is why don't look at the fall of Europe or fall of America. In fact, Maharishi Aurobindo has prophesied. In the ruins of the West, India will rise. It is exactly yeah. opposite. Of, yeah, <laughs> exactly just, opposite of what uh, Raghuram Rajan would like to have. He would like I us just, to bury the ruins of the West. <laughs> uh, just to add to Dr. MRV's point, uh, think about this: How many of us go and buy a little bit of gold, even if that much, on the Akshay Triti a day? Exactly. Think about that. So, next question from um, Steel Plant Baba again. Why is a high rupee rate exchange rate of 82 per dollar not a cause for concern for the current government? Didn't BJP make a hue and cry about exchange rate as being 60 prior to 2014 elections? BJP did make a hue and cry about it because they were in the opposition. And it is the duty of the current opposition to make a hue and cry, cry which is the Congress. But the problem again, as I said, the Congress has lost both their intellectual firepower, political firepower, credible uh, credibility firepower to do anything constructive in India. And they are become some loose cannons who can't deal with anything substantive. Be that as it may, again I repeat, 82 rupees to a dollar per se does not mean that you are uh, in a weak side or on a strength on a stronger footing. Absolutely, 82 rupees to a dollar is not the barometer of your uh, strength of your economy. Your strength of the economy depends on several other things. Of it, this may be one important, probably one uh, crucial factor, but not the holistic determinatory factor. China has depreciated its currency. Philippines has depreciated. Japan has depreciated. Uh, Indonesia has depreciated. Now, you can say my rupee is at 75 and lose the export markets, whatever little that you have, or you depreciate the rupee, hope that you will catch up with the export markets, hope that you can cut some fuel taxes and do something and jugglery and still maintain the inflation rate and go ahead. Now, these are two matrices available with you. The government in all its wisdom has chosen a certain path of action. You may agree, disagree, that's entirely different, but chosen a path of action. Now, to say that 
82 rupees is worse than 60 rupees. Now your inflation between India and uh, USA for the last uh, eight years is at least four percent. Now if you calculate that four percent for 82 uh, for eight years, it comes to around compounding at around uh, 30 percent, 30 to 40 percent. So rupees should be around minimum of around 84 to 90 rupees. It's still at 82. If you look at those type of calculations, hard hard calculations, you will find the rupee stronger than what it is should be people are clamoring there is a there is an exporter who would always clamor for 100 rupees 200 rupees 300 rupees that, that leave that lobby around there are economies who are clamoring for a weaker rupee and they, don't get me wrong they 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 have backed their arguments with certain fundamental facts you may agree and disagree that's entirely different but there is a compelling argument also from the other side to make the rupee weaker Next question, please. Sachin Sharma wants to know, what if India decides to move away from the US dollar? How much will it impact the Indian economy? Will it be good or bad to move away from the dollar? So you are asking as if the dollar is uh, the brand of underwear. You can move from one brand to the other because it doesn't suit you. See, <laughs> dollar, dollar is the preeminence. Again, I give the metaphor. The dollar is like the sun. Can the earth move away from the sun and say that I don't like this sun. I want to have another sun. So I will travel all along some 500 billion kilometers uh, into our space and find a new sun, which is far, far better than the existing sun. Ideally, yes, we'd like to get into a better one. But it's not so easy. Putin is trying. China is trying. And we are watching. It's not that we are we are uh, anxious about it either ways. We are watching the whole development. And this will pan out. See, uh, let us be very clear. Dollar has its own intrinsic uh, contradictions. And that will explode on the face of the global economy one day or the other. Whether it will happen in our lifetime or not, I don't know. But it will happen. So India need not move away from the dollar. The dollar will move away from India. That also can happen. Saswat wants to know how to compensate for the revenue deficit if taxes are reduced. See, when you reduce taxes, there is something called buoyancy. See, when, when taxes are reduced, more people get incentive to first buy, do activities. And also people who have not paid taxes believe that the cost of evasion is probably very, very uh, narrow. The differential uh, between cost of evasion and cost of paying tax is so narrow. Let them pay taxes and let us go ahead with it. So everybody takes a calculation and a calculated uh, uh, matrix of what is ideal for them. When you reduce taxes, you always get compensated by buoyancy. So it goes like this, that more the taxes you reduce like this, the revenue also goes up. Up this point may be the point on which we can work out and say that this is the sweet spot. Rohit Patil wants to know, lockdown had W work from home and reduced oil consumption. Why government doesn't give corporate tax incentives for work from home to reduce oil import bill? See, this work from home, I am told, uh, has run its full course. It's, it may work in software. It may work in some business. In, in my business, you can't have work from home. A lawyer's business, we require intense meeting of clients. We fly to meet clients. We go have to go to the court. We have to explain every document to the court. You mean to say I can do this uh, from uh, sitting at my office uh, here in Chennai and explain to a judge in say Ahmedabad? It's very difficult. So every uh, you can't have your plumber working from home and setting right your uh, <laughs> tap. He has to come to your home and he has to. This may be an, a very small set of people uh, in software, maybe possible maybe back end in banking may be possible maybe some government employees can work from home on alternative days but majority of us the farmer cannot uh, you know do work from home he has to go to the farm you can't have the plumber you can't have the doctor you can't have the lawyers uh, all these things will not work you have to necessarily go and uh, see what it is. next question please um ca vishwanathan v do you think Russia will lead the world within his within Putin's tenure and give a run for money for the dollar? I don't want to engage in any crystal ball gazing. Maybe what I see is that is his idea. I'm not saying that he will succeed or not. Only time will tell. But that is his idea. 
Manu Kumar wants to know, should there be more small banks for individuals who look towards manufacturing sector with government giving incentives and reforms? In fact, it is my, uh, if I were the finance minister, I would think about 600 district banks with eminent people from those districts being on the board. And 1% incentive is paid to those people from the district depositing their money into their bank, that particular bank. One major corporate is asked to handle that bank. And that bank lends to manufacturing sector of MSMEs within that district. So, you know, you create district level banks that will take care of uh, the district's requirement. It is a time that we need to look about uh, MSME funding, big way and a better way. This government did start, its heart is in the right place as far as MSMEs is concerned. But as, unfortunately, as far as uh, delivering anything substantial for MSMEs is lacking. Kapil Srivatsa wants to know your view on the future of cryptos, please. The so cryptos are something that uh, you have to understand have no place in this modern economy. Dr. Swami has a totally divergent view. Now, after this collapse from 60,000 to less than $19,000, I believe that unless cryptos are backed by anything substantial. Please understand dollar itself. You have to have an asset. You have to have an asset. Dollar itself is the biggest crypto. It is not backed by anything. Okay. It is only backed by the American army. So, so today what crypto is nothing but some digital number being passed on from one number, one person to other. I pass on a random number to IR and say, you pay me $60,000 or $50,000 and IR passes to you. And says you pay me eighty thousand uh, dollars. The world is not, you can fool sometime some people. You can't fool everybody all the time. So cryptos is one thing which is whose bubble has burst. I think it is impossible uh, to sustain it. It was sustained by excessive liquidity till say uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, and after which liquidity has dried up, and then you find cryptos fall. Thank you so much, Dr. M.R. Venkatesh. It was one hour, 22 minutes and counting. And you spoke probably for the most part. I didn't see you take a sip of water. Takes enormous amount of concentration. I was whipping you left, right and center. So were the uh, our uh, viewers. And, and I hope viewers, you got an enriching conversation. We looked at just about everything around the world. Under the carpet, looked at even the sun going around the moon or uh, the, the earth uh, deciding to go away from the sun. A lot of things got discussed. I hope you got value for this uh, time that you invested. After all, you could have done a lot of good things. This is Navratri week. Thank you so much. A lot of people responded. Do send in your comments and please like, share and subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to, don't forget to click on the bell button for notification. Namaskar.